Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Is marriage important to you? Do you realize that the Bible clearly says that marriage is a covenant? We find that in the book of Malachi, where God is speaking to men, and he says to the husband, she is your wife by covenant. And we've talked about that as all covenants in the Bible, the primary purpose is to glorify God. So if you're not serious about your marriage, if it's not important to you, if you're not following the role that God has given to the man and given to the woman for this marital relationship, the covenant of marriage, then you are heading for spiritual disaster. We've talked as well that a man, if he does not love his wife and demonstrate and show that love once more, submitting to the role and the work of the husband, that it is going to greatly, in a negative way, affect his spiritual life. It will hinder his prayers. It will hinder his ability to worship God and serve God. So it is in our interest to develop a marriage that is in obedience to the covenantal laws of marriage and one that manifests the glory of God. And I can assure you, no matter how long you've been married, no matter what state your marriage is in, it needs improvement and God can help you improve. And that has what been the primary objective of our study in this book, The Song of Songs. Pay attention to that name, The Song of Songs, meaning the best song. And songs and music, it was for the purpose of enjoyment. When you have a God-pleasing covenantal marriage, you are going to derive pleasure. It will be a source of satisfaction, comfort. It will be a blessing for you and your spouse. So get serious about marriage. Well, we have come to the last chapter in the book of Song of Songs. Solomon is writing this song or play in a way of a confession. Solomon, we know, the wisest man ever. But that doesn't mean that he was always successful, faithful, obedient to the wisdom that God had afforded to him. And Solomon wrote this book, the Song of Songs, much like he did the book of Ecclesiastes or Kohelet in a sense of a confession, saying, don't do as I have done, but rather learn from me and understand in the way that the book of Kohelet or Ecclesiastes end, here's the summation of all things. Obey God and keep his commands. This is the source of that which endures lasting and has eternal significance. Same thing what we're learning today and what we have been learning throughout this book of Song of Songs. It is going to impact your eternity if you submit in the present world to the biblical truth concerning marriage. Well, we've seen that the two primary individuals, the characters of this song, is a woman, Shulamit, that's what she's called. It's a description. And also her lover, her husband, the shepherd. And we've seen that, that the Shulamite has been taken 
brought into the king's palace and she's not content there she is starving for that love that relationship that satisfaction that she found in her her husband solomon simply took that and believed that that was going to be a source of joy and satisfaction for him and throughout this book we've seen over and over her attempts and his as well for being reunited and now finally we've reached my favorite chapter chapter 8 the conclusion where they do in fact find this reunification and we learn so much about that their relationship about marriage about love all of this in the form of instruction so with that said take out your bible and look with me to the book of song of songs and now chapter 8 the final chapter we read here in verse 1 who will give you as a brother to me now we have mentioned that there is a degree of insecurity within women in regard to their relationship with their spouse and we have seen in the past throughout our study and we're going to see emphasized now how she is seeking security in this relationship and we read here who will set you as my brother or as a brother unto me now what is she saying here well a sister being with her brother publicly there's no problem with that people don't want to to destroy that relationship between a brother and sister and in that same way she wants that same commitment that same family relationship that same uh, uh, situation that overcomes that that a brother has with his sister she is looking for security in this this solid solid relationship that brings security so she says who will set you or make you or give you as a brother unto me as one who nurse the breast of my mother now here again what is this speaking about well this growth going back to this common union and going forward she wants that same type of union relationship that which society affirms she wants her relationship to be affirmed by others by the public so that there's no attack against it because that's what she's experienced this separation so she's pleading for this security she says in that situation i would find you outside and i would kiss you and then she says also they would not scorn me so in the current situation because in one sense she publicly belongs to king solomon we see that in a very significant uh, place in this book in chapter 3 beginning with verse 6 and we're going to see something very similar to that in a few minutes this is the day that we talked about of solomon's marriage that he comes up from the wilderness he's got these soldiers with him with these swords ready for battle in order that he might take her and what she's saying here is i want my relationship with the shepherd to be affirmed to be recognized that i might be secure in it publicly that i don't have to worry about what others are saying or what others might do in coming against this relationship look now to verse 2 she says here i would lead you and i would bring you to the house of my mother once again 
a place of security, a place where she felt safe, her home. She says, I would bring you there. And she says at the end, to the house of my mother where she taught me. So the same things that she experienced growing up in regard to a marriage, she wants to experience that with him. Now, the point that we should glean from that is this. If you're married and you have children, your marriage is going to greatly impact, influence how your children sees marriage, how they will behave in regard to their marital commitment. And she is affirming, I learned from my mom about marriage. And I want that same experience. Isn't it wonderful? Wouldn't you want a relationship with your spouse that you could say, I want that same marriage that I have with my spouse. I want that same type of marriage for my children. Or are you someone saying, I hope that they have a better marriage than me and my spouse. That's tragic. And therefore, we need to affirm with God, all things are possible. He can bring change. He is extremely committed to the covenant of marriage. And what it takes for that change to begin is two people, or at least one of them, saying, I desire that. Better than both, but even one can bring about this change to bring God into the relationship, to change that other one as he changes you as well. So this is what she's saying. I would give you drink. She's saying drink satisfaction. Also, drink can be an element of joy. She says, I would give to you drink of, of wine or spiced wine. Here again. We talked about in the previous study that, that drinks were mixed and not just alcoholic drinks, but drinks in general with different juices and such. And she says here, I would give you spice wine with, with pomegranate juice. And all of this is an, a way of sharing that she would be a provider, a giver, an investor in this relationship for the point or the purpose of bringing joy to her spouse. So notice the principle. And this is what you need to write down and learn. Men, as you foster security in your wife, it is going to bring about her activity that is going to bring about satisfaction and joy in your life. That's what the scripture's teaching here. It is a biblical promise that God is making. Verse, verse 3. We've seen this many other places throughout this book. She says, his left hand is under my head. Remember, that's support. The first thing that he does in thinking about intimacy and growing close to her and experiencing that love, his thoughts are not of himself but for her. His left hand is under my head. And with his right hand, what does he do? He embraces me. The word here is more for the term hug me. But it's an embracement. It speaks about how first he thinks of her before. There's that growing intimacy between them. And then she charges others that this is what marriage is about. This is what we should strive for. Verse 4, she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem. She says, do not uh, stir and do not wake up. Now, the implication is, why would you disturb this for what reason would you wake this up and, and disturb what's going on? This love, let it be, in other words, until it, it has its delight, until it reaches, reaches the climax, reaches the pinnacle, reaches the, the purpose of a loving covenantal marriage. 
Don't let things interfere with it. It's precious and it's very fragile. That's what she's admonishing and teaching the young women. Now go to verse 5. We've reached the, the reunion. We read, and remember, I shared with you just a few minutes ago how similar this is to what we read in chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, when Solomon comes up from the wilderness for the day of his marriage. So that same imagery is being used here, but this time for her and her shepherd lover. Verse 5. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, laying upon her beloved? Now, this has such implication. She's coming up in wilderness. Remember what the term midbar refers to. That which is empty, that which has nothing, but it's a cause to dependence, trust, believing in. And that's what she's done. She's trusted God. She's put her faith in him. She's relied upon the Lord. And he is bringing them back together. So here she is coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved one under the, the apple. And when if we look at this term tepuach throughout this, this scripture, you find that it's a place of joy. It's a place that has a pleasing fragrance. It's a place of preference. And this is what the scripture is saying. She is in her preferred place. Not in the palace. Not with King Solomon. Not because he's wealthy and he has power and everything. No, her preference is this shepherd. A simple man. Not a wealthy man. But a godly man knowing how to be faithful to his flock and therefore faithful to her. And she says, I will, will stir you up or awaken you there. Now where? It goes back to this image of security. She's found that safe place with him. Through this relationship, she's found security. Why do I say that? Notice what it says. I will awaken you there. Where? In the place that your mother bore you. Now, this is actually the word for labor, was in labor for you. And there she was in labor and she gave birth to you. Now, why is this image? Well, it's talking about a new life, a birth, new life. And even though Solomon, he attacked this relationship. He took her and brought her into his palace, into his inner chambers. Nevertheless, that is in the past. She has been reunited with him, and there's a new start, a new beginning. The imagery here, a new birth has taken place. Verse 6. Now, beginning with verse 6, Solomon in beginning to wrap up this song, he gives us some very significant principles, truths in regarding love, a marriage, a love that is rooted in a covenantal marriage. She is speaking and she says, set me as a seal. Now the word chotam is a seal and it speaks of ownership, possession, responsibility. Not in, and we've seen this, not in a domineering way, but to say, as she has before, I am my beloved, he is for me, and I am for, for him. So it's this, this surrendering. And when she says, set me as a seal, what she's saying is, I'm yours. Acknowledge this relationship. Set me as a seal upon your heart. Now, what does one do with the heart? Think. She says, I want to, to own your thoughts. I want your thoughts, everything that you do, that you need to remember me, to take me into consideration. What a wise thing to do, men. Don't make decisions 
without taking your wife into consideration. And not just thinking of her, discussing it, sharing the issue. Because she's your helpmate, and one of the things we learn biblically is that a helpmate is also a counselor. So set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arms. Now, arms, well, normally when this word is used, especially in, in Hebrew culture, it's for holding something. We find here that it's another term of embracing. Many, many years ago, there was a song, My Embraceable You. And it talks about how he wants his arms about you. So embrace me, my embraceable you. I want my arms around you. Well, this is what he's saying. That, that, that he understands why she's saying, set me as a seal upon your arms. Now, arms can also be synonymous, not just with embracing, but deeds, actions. So not just what you're deciding to do, but, but, but do things in regard to me. For as strong as death is love. Love brings about death, and some things need to die. There's some things, men, that uh, you were doing prior to getting married, things that you might do, and I'm not saying that these things are necessarily bad, but they're no longer necessary for a mature man. In Israel, where I live, I see men all the time taking vacations, going to places with other men for a weekend to, to do whatever. We travel to Romania a lot. We fly to Bucharest. Bucharest has a casino. And we see so many times that the plane is full of, of men going away to have a weekend of gambling. Now, gambling's not right, but, but to spend time doing something apart from your spouse, this is immaturity. So she says here, very carefully, for as strong as death is love. When you love your wife, certain things will die out. They will just be set aside. They will be forgotten. They will be ignored. The same thing with our love for God. Because I love God, there's things that I no longer do, no longer interest to me, no longer appropriate, no longer in, in keeping with that covenantal commitment between myself and Him. So love is as strong as death and as hard as Sheol. One gets to Sheol, and here we're talking about, about probably Gehinom. And the point here is that it is destructive. So what it says here is this, that love brings about, about the death of those things that are destructive. And, and we need to realize that a wrong experience of love is jealousy jealousy is like a flame of fire that uh, flames so it emphasizes it, it uses one word for flame twice and a different word for flame once so it's talking about the flaming flames of fire that that flame so it's speaking about burning away. Jealousy can, can burn away, destroy those things that are good in a relationship. Jealousy, not appropriate. Verse 7, speaking about love, it says, Many waters, many waters cannot quench it, not set it, turn it off. And it says, as well, in regard to love, and streams are not able to what? Sweep it away. So a, a true love overcomes. Now we could just stop and read from Paul's writings in regard to love in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that great love chapter, and speak of how love persevere, love overcomes, love endures. This is what Solomon is saying. It is not drowned out. 
and it is not swept away by, by flood waters. It endures. And then notice the end of verse 7. If a man was to give all of his, the word is hone in Hebrew. Well, it speaks about his net worth. It's probably the best way to, to understand it. So everything that makes up his net worth financially, all of his possessions, all of the things that are in his portfolio, his estate. He says, if a man would offer everything, all that he has, all the, the estate, the possessions of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. Why? Because love is greater than that. So what it's saying here, if you have on one hand, a godly marriage that that is a source of love a covenantal love between a man and a woman and you have everything that he has accumulated in his life now who's speaking Solomon he's wealthy and when he talks about these it's the love of a godly marriage that that is exceedingly superior to that of all the possessions that an individual can have. That's what he's saying, verse 8. Now, we're going back to uh, the family. But here we've seen, going back to chapter 1, her brothers have not really appreciated her for who she is. They apparently have kind of evaluated her in a very... Uh, a uh, secular way comparing her to simply other women and outward beauty thinking that a woman's value worth is seen only on the outward appearance so notice what they say in verse 8 her brothers are speaking and they say a little sister we have and breasts she she doesn't have now, remember, breast here is speaking about the very essence of a, a woman. And what they're saying here is, this is our sister. And, and we have not appreciated her or looked at her as we do other women. And because of that, they have kind of had contempt for her. They see her as insignificant. But they are wrong, and the scripture is going to point that out. Notice what it says. A sister we have, a little sister we have, breasts she does not have. What shall we do to our sister in the day that he speaks of her? Meaning, when a man wants to marry her. See, we thought, speaking about the brothers, and this is like the chorus, teaching us something they thought that she wasn't much of a, a catch wouldn't be all that desirable but now they're seeing a man taking great interest and they need to provide they need to to give something a dowry and they're saying what what is being being expected we're, we're not prepared for it's saying how valuable she is and that they were not aware of it. That's why it says, look at verse 9. If she is a wall. Now, I mentioned to you that there are two different Hebrew words for wall. One is kir. It's like the wall inside your, your home or in an office or a, a regular building. But the word homa is a wall that surrounds the city. Now, a wall in a house is for support, for, for a separation. But a wall, the city, is for defense. It brings about security and safety. Without that wall, it is vulnerable. And what they're saying here, look carefully at verse 9. If she was a wall... We would build, concerning her, a castle of silver. Now, 
What this is saying is this. It's a change in their perspective. They began, she's not really much of a woman. But when they hear what the one who is speaking for her that wants her is saying, they're totally unprepared for that. And now there's a, a quick change in the text. They're saying, see now, if you have something of little value, you're going to uh, not really worry so much about it. But if you have something of great value, you're going to want maybe to put it in a safe, a safety deposit box, something that is secure. So the greater a value, the greater protection and precaution you're going to take to secure it. And they're saying if she was the wall of a city, then inside it, based upon the, the how that wall, how strong it is, what type of job it would do in defense and security, then what would be appropriate is a castle of silver. And if she is a door, then we would enclose her with uh, um, a border of, of cedar. And here again, cedar a fine wood, the same type of wood that was used for, for the temple. So here in this verse, in verse 9, it's exalting her. They're recognizing her value as a godly woman. Verse 10, she speaks, I am a wall and my breasts are towers. Now here again, wall she is of of great value and her breast she's saying no you thought i had none that my womanhood wasn't wasn't very much because they saw her simply as a sister from a different perspective but now they had a change of perspective and her womanhood are like towers meaning it it exceeds over a tower is higher than the other type of building, so she exceeds all other women. That's what it means here when it says her breasts are towers. Look now to, to the last part of verse 10. Then I will be in his eyes as one who has found peace. Peace fulfillment. Finally, she's being recognized as who she is, that she is the spouse of this one. And when she says, basically, finally I have found, then it will be in his eyes that I am one that has found peace. So the, the reunion is complete. Now look at the summary verses. This is where we get greater wisdom to understand what Solomon wants to leave us with. Verse 11. There was a vineyard to Solomon. Now, vineyard produces grapes, love. And notice what it says. It was in Baal Hamon. Baal is an owner or husband. And the word Hamon means many. And he's saying something. It goes back to what first kings tell us. That he had 700 wives, 300 concubines. He had many women in his life. Hamon, Nashim, many women. So who, Solomon, who Hayat Baal, Hamon. He was a husband of many. This is what's being taught. Natan et hakerem le notrim. He had all of these women. He couldn't deal with them. So he gave the vineyard to those who would take care of it, the vineyard workers. And every man was supposed to bring forth from its fruit Elif Kesef, 100 pieces, or excuse me, Elif, 1,000 pieces of silver. So this vineyard was, was extremely valuable from a, a monetary standpoint. Verse, verse 12. Now we're speaking in a different sense it says my vineyard is before me now probably she is speaking and she's saying 
I don't belong to anyone other than my, my beloved. Some understand this as he speaking, and he's saying my vineyard, referring to the woman, is, is mine. And a thousand, meaning a thousand pieces of silver, is given to you, Solomon, and 200 to those who tend its fruit. So he's saying, you know what? You can have all the, the financial production. You can have all these women that, that make a great profit financially for you. But I'm keeping my vineyard for what it is to me. Verse 13. The one who dwells in vineyards. Now, he has been associated several times in the text as dwelling in the vineyards. Now, it says, Ha Yoshevet Bagani. Yoshevet is feminine. So she now, it's another way of saying that she is in the gardens. This is where he has been spoken of in many other chapters. He has invited her to come. Now she dwells in the vineyards. And she says here, your friends, listen. Now, this is a term of, of admonition. It is instruction. Your friends, listen to your voice. Make me to hear it. So here, what's happening is, his friends are listening. And what are they hearing? They are hearing that he has recognized her voice. What does that mean? That she is on her way to him. Verse 14. Flee, my beloved. Now, she is speaking. She says, flee, my beloved, and be to me. And, and, and you are likened. Let me get this right. Flee, my beloved, and you be like a, a deer or a young deer among the, the uh, uh, young deers upon the, the mountain, mountains of spices. Mountains of spices talks about the partaking of love. So she's saying, I'm where I'm supposed to be. You flee unto me. You escape unto me. And there you will enjoy the mountains, not mountain, but mountains of spices. So what this scripture speaks of is a beautiful imagery of them coming together, not in a garden, but garden's abundance. Solomon had his vineyards, but he had his gardens. And what it's saying is this, is that she, in this beautiful covenant marriage, is exceedingly uh, uh, pleasurable, prosperous to him in this, this intimate covenant marriage that she satisfies, and he satisfies her. And together, they have great joy in this relationship. And that's what Solomon is writing for, so that you and I, that we can experience a godly covenantal marriage, one that brings glory to God and how people can see the joy, the satisfaction, the pleasure that comes from experiencing the relationship that we have, a godly relationship that we have with our spouse. Well, let me conclude our study by, by giving you two things that you ought to be doing together. One is reading scripture reading scripture together, secondly, praying together. Those two things, and I've heard many other people testify, those who are marital counselors, those who teach on marriage as an emphasis to, to their own ministries, they are right. Pray with your spouse and study God's word with your spouse. It is going to lay the foundation for an unbelievable intimacy. As you grow closer to the Lord, you will grow closer to one another. Why? Well, think of this. The wife is here. The man's there. 
God is in front. And as you move closer to God, you move closer to one another. That's the imagery that we see being taught. Well, my hope and my prayer is that in some way, this study of the book of Song of Songs will be a blessing to your marriage, to your household, to your children, to their children, and that you will lay the foundation for generations to come that walk in faith, that live in a covenantal marriage, a marriage that manifests God's glory and is an instrument of the joy that he provides. We'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.